we're going to do is give you a little bit of history about the hunters raid narrative and with that we'll have the reading of the enslaved families that lived here in 1864 and to do that will be my colleague Dr. Gloria Braxton again a member of the African American Advisory Group. Thank you Ramona. Almost 151 years ago to the day on June 17, 1864, Union troops under Major General David Hunter's command came onto Jefferson's Poplar Forest and liberated 38 of 48 enslaved men, women, and children. Major General David Hunter Born in Washington, D.C., and a strong opponent of slavery, worked closely with Abraham Lincoln. On the outbreak of the American Civil War, he joined the Union Army and became a colonel of the 3rd U.S. Army. In early spring 1862, Hunter was appointed commander of the Department of the South and began enlisting black soldiers in the occupied district of South Carolina. When ordered to disband this regiment of soldiers of African descent, he went to Congress and eventually gained approval for his actions. Hunter then issued a bold proclamation declaring forever free enslaved Africans in three states, Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina. Fearing that slave owners in border states would join the Confederates, Abraham Lincoln quickly ordered Hunter to retract this proclamation. Confederate President Jefferson Davis and leaders of the Confederate Army issued orders to execute Hunter if captured. Major General Hunter's proclamation was nothing less than the abolition of slavery by military authority. He had no special authority from the War Department to issue the order, but promulgated it by virtue of his absolute powers as military ruler over territory under martial law. Hunter's raid, more commonly known as the Battle of Lynchburg, took place on June 17th and 18th, 1864 and describes the tense days when General David Hunter and his army of 18,000 Union soldiers were ordered to capture Lynchburg. For the Union Army, this important campaign might cripple the Confederacy permanently and end the war. The Sandusky House was commandeered by Hunter as the Union Army headquarters, but Hunter was driven out of Lynchburg by Confederate General Jubal Early, saving the Hill City from major destruction. It was during this Lynchburg campaign that General David Hunter entered Poplar Forest and freed 38 of the 48 enslaved Africans. So today, we join other Juneteenth celebrations and the International Coalition to commemorate African ancestors of the Middle Passage who are conducting simultaneous activities across the United States and around the world during this month of June. We commemorate today 
by calling their names. It is our way of restoring the humanity, cultural identity, dignity, and pride. We celebrate as we draw on their strength, as we draw on their courage, and as we draw on their determination to overcome obstacles of enormous magnitude. These are the names of the 48 who were enslaved here in 1864. Matilda, John Eccles, Judy, Israel Anderson, Margaret, Phil Anderson, Beverly, Jacob, Doctor, Mary Jane, Catherine, Maria, William Armistead, George Hutter, Ada Byron, Eleanor, Ned, Martha, Victorine, Lydia, Ida Reeder, Joseph, Peggy, Kitty Davis, Harriet, Beverly, Solomon Davis, Hunter, Katie, Sophia, Washington Brown, William, Ann, Rachel, Sarah, John, David, Emily, James, Susan, Sonny, Elizabeth, Coleman, Frank, Mary Ellen, Dicey, Katie, and Lucretia. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. It's very sobering. So many people who lived here, and all we have is their first name. We don't know where they went. We don't know who their families were. But we do lift them up this morning, and we're hopeful that their lives weren't in vain for themselves. This young man, his name is Terrell Sneed. He's originally from New Jersey. He now lives in Appomattox, but he's going to be leaving us soon. And he's going somewhere that we're very familiar with, the Caribbean. He's going to the Dominican Republic. And so this may be his last performance here in the United States and we're so blessed to have him. He's going to perform I Sometimes Wonder and a poem without a title. So here he is, let's give him a big hand, Mr. Terrell Sneed. Um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm really happy to be here. It's, it's actually kind of moving to be here and to be um, involved with this because uh, I'm, I'm 48 years old, and, and I look in the crowd, and I see the people, and there's different age groups here. And I think about, there's some people in this crowd, and you might have been children, but there's people in this crowd who, um, who lived during, like, Jim Crow. Who lived during the time when someone was lynched, or someone wasn't given the ability to vote. Um, who lived in a time where interracial marriage was illegal. In this, uh, in this country or in this state. 
And to see us all sitting here together, I mean, what I mean is moving, it really is moving to me. Um, it means just so much to me. Um, I want to do some spoken word for you. Everything I, I give you is, is, is from my, is straight from my heart. And um, I, 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 hope, I hope you appreciate it. Um, just a little background around myself, about myself. Um, I'm retired law enforcement from uh, New Jersey. Um, I served seven years in the uh, Marine Corps. I served in two conflicts. And um, I cannot imagine what it is to be a slave. I cannot. But I can, I know, I do know what it feels like to give your entire life to your country and still feel um, like sometimes you feel less than. Or serve someone for your entire life and feel less than. So, this poem that I'm going to do is called I Sometimes Wonder. Can I move the I sometimes wonder about things I read about in the past, like if I was a slave, how long would I have lasted? Would I be so strong and be so bold after I was beat and my family sold? Torn away from everything that you've ever known where they literally work your fingers to the bone, being told you're not human because you're not white, but then hear them rape your women at night. Branded like livestock and drug around with chains of steel, you couldn't resist or you get killed. How would you feel? You ever wonder about the Indians? You know the only true Native Americans offer promises and giving guarantees just to find out that your whole world is under siege. I mean, could you watch your whole family purposely be wiped out by disease? They would steal everything that you ever owned. Could you watch someone call your home their home? What if they separate you from your family and then marked you with some stamp and then shipped you off to some concentration camp? Could you watch someone starve your children and torture your wife? Because you stand in a line that you knew was going to end your life. How long could you hold your breath once they turned on that gas? And they didn't care, women, children, they just laughed. They used to use bayonets to save bullets, I was told, and then let the bodies pile up in the cold. Something so horrific they called the Holocaust. How could you deal with people saying that it's not true? It's a lie, it's false. I sometimes wonder about the great Martin Luther King and his I Have a Dream speech and all the beautiful songs he would sing. Could you march with something knowing that it might be your last steps? Would you say, turn the other cheek, realizing it might be your last breath? <laughs> During the Great Depression, people used to stand in line just for bread, and when, you, when they ran out, you just weren't fed. When was the last time any of you hungry when you went to bed? Are you listening or just nodding your head? Because so often we think we got it so bad, I can guarantee someone had it worse than you had. I mean, that sky, that's the same blue sky that they would see, and that air you breathe, that's the same air that they would breathe, and that tree, someone might have hung from that tree. What I'm trying to tell you that these people are no different than you and me. I sometimes wonder what would happen 50 years ago, if me and my white wife walked down this very street, would I stand tall or would I retreat? Would I get lynched or just get beat? Or how today's sophisticated woman would cope without having a legal right to vote? Would you, could you have the strength to climb that slippery slope? I mean, I would only hope. I mean, we complained about the microwave being too slow and got too much grass to mow and can't miss that TV show and call athletes heroes. When was the last time you helped anyone? Do you even know? And just a reminder, you will reap what you sow. I once read the life expectancy of a Vietnam soldier was 16 minutes. 16 minutes. If I told everybody in here you had to volunteer 16 minutes, how many of you would complain before you finished? And I can tell by your look in your face that some of you are mad or sad or confused 
where this took place. Don't think this happened in some foreign land because a lot of this happened right where you stand because man got a lot of blood on his hands. And yes, that includes Uncle Sam. It is said that history will repeat itself. It is guaranteed if we believe history on the bookshelf. I mean, you should at least read Howard Zinn, if nothing else. I mean, don't you watch the, watch the news? People are still slaves to the money and drugs they used, and women and children are, are being abused, and greed is oppression's mother, and people are using race and religion to kill one another. Can we truly make peace? Can we truly all become sisters and brothers? I sometimes wonder about things I read about in the past, like, will it happen again, but with a different cast? Or can we, as a people, get it at last? I sometimes wonder. Thank you. There's another um, piece that I have. Uh, it is called Poem With No Title. And it just kind of just talks about, uh, like what I tried to explain before, about my life and just uh, African-American man, or as a black man in the United States, um, the stereotypes that we are given, or uh, just not being looked at, uh, like I said, by my character, or my education, or the things that I've done in my life. And when I say that again, um, it, 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 it didn't matter that I was uh, a law enforcement officer. It didn't matter that I was in the Marine Corps. It didn't matter that I was a um, a business owner. When I got, you know, even when I got pulled over before they saw my badge or, or walking down the street, to them, to some people, I was just that stereotypical um, in their mind, that stereotypical uh, black man. What they want wanted me to be as a black man. So this is called a poem with no title. I am black and I'm a man. I am a proud black man. But your definition of black is not who I am. I remember going to elementary school and being black was the exception, not the rule. Surrounded around kids I was told I wasn't supposed to like. But how was I supposed to like kids that treated me all right? So I came to my friend and I said, can you come to my house to play? He said, no, my dad won't let me go to the nigga's house. No, no way. I went home and asked my mother what nigger meant. She explained it to me that night. I cried myself to sleep, hoping I'd wake up white. Get out of high school, decided to join the Marine Corps. It was in 1990, 91, during the Gulf War. I loved the Marine Corps, but the lingo 24-7. My uniform was high and tight. Then the so-called brother walks up to me and says, this white boy here is acting blacker than you. You need to stop acting white. I said, I'm not acting white. I'm acting like a Marine. Once you put this uniform on, everyone's just green. I don't know what I did that day to provoke his attack, but that night I went to sleep, hoping I wake up black. I got out of the Marine Corps. And, excuse me. I got out of the Marine Corps and decided to take the police test. They said they're looking for the cream of the crop, you know, the best of the best. A few weeks later, I got a call. They offered me a badge. I asked about my white friend John because he had the same score that I had. Mind your business. Just worry about you. John don't fit the quota. He don't look like you do. You know what they say, it ain't no fun when the rabbit got the gun. But two wrongs don't make a right. So who really won? So that night, I was glad I wasn't white. A few years later on the job, I rode up on the crowd. I could still hear him. Kill him, kill him. I could still hear it was so loud. Drew my weapon, called for backup, told everybody to get down. There's a group of black and white people trying to kill this Mexican man on the ground. Now, they would have killed this man if I wouldn't have showed up. This, I know, is true. That night, I went to sleep, proud that I was blue. A few years later on the job, I, I, got a call, I got a phone call. Terrell, three men broke into your mother's house. And yes, we caught them all. Now they say, we are the people who are supposed to take care of each other. If that's so true, then why do these three so-called brothers murder my black mother? Now she's gone, and there ain't nothing that's ever going to bring her back. But that night, I realized it makes no difference that we're all black. Twelve years ago, I met someone who's literally changed my life. She's given me the privilege of making her my wife. Giving me the vision to set myself free of all the labels I've been given by society. Never feeling the pressure of me being black and her being white. Last night, I went to sleep, 
and I slept soundly all night. Now my mother, she was mixed and she had fair skin and my father black with a little Creole and Indian. Based on trying to tell you, just like you, I'm not 100% sure what I am, but there's one thing I am sure, I'm more than your definition of a black man. I'm a true husband, loyal patriot, and good father. And if you need to add black to that, please don't bother. Because I am black, and I am a man, I am a proud black man. But your definition of black is not who I am. So if labeling me to you is somewhat vital, then just like this poem, I'd rather have no title. Thank you. Thank you very much. Woo!